They have taken 17% of their most productive area. They're not sanctioning the, the gas that flows into Europe. They're not sanctioning the oil that flows through the pipes into Europe. So they have got no business to tell us whether we can buy it or not buy it. Welcome to another episode. Today we have a very special guest with us, a retired army officer and esteemed author, Colonel Ajay Singh. His latest book is on one of the most important conflict of our generation, the Russia-Ukraine war. Let's hear more on it from him. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Pleasure being out here, Shivam. Sir, to begin with, would you like to introduce the conflict to someone who doesn't understand what happened? Well, if you take a look at it today, of course, you're talking about the Russia-Ukraine war, which has been going for a year plus. But to understand the conflict, you have to go deep behind into history. And this conflict actually going on since 2014, you know, when the Ukraine decided to move away from Russia toward the European orbit. That is when they had the so-called the Euro Maidan protest which came about in which pro and pro-Russian speaking and anti-Russian speaking people actually got into conflict. That is when Russia annexed the Crimea, they interfered directly in the Donbass. And the conflict between Russia and Ukraine has been going on since 2014. So this is only a mere extension of the conflict. The flashpoint for this, of course, was their joining NATO. Or Ukraine wanted to join NATO which led to this. But we must understand this conflict has been going on for the past eight years now. Who would you say are the primary entities of, of this conflict? See, there are two primary entities, of course, Russia, Ukraine. But the hidden entities are the USA, NATO and China, of course. China did not get directly involved in the causes of the war. But there is no way in which Russia could have done it without Chinese support. If you take a look at it, Putin went to Beijing about two weeks before the war. Obviously, it was to get his unspoken sanction for it. And USA, in any case, there are two things. One is Biden's personal animosity towards Putin. The other is the fact that they want to weaken Russia. Similarly with NATO, there was a concept that they want to get Russia into their fold. But now that has been diluted and instead they are talking about weakening Russia and keeping it away, which is going to be very, very unproductive in the long run. Could you explain to us why Ukraine becomes a part of the NATO will imply on Russia become weaker? See, Ukraine becoming part of NATO means NATO will be able to place its offensive weaponry and soldiers on Ukrainian soil which is bang on the border of Russia. So then Russia security is definitely impinged. And Putin has got a point when he says, if NATO comes into Ukraine, Russia has got no place further behind to go into. So by coming so close to Russia, yes, the Rus NATO has shown a remarkable misunderstanding of, Ukraine, of Russian sensibilities. They have backtracked on the promise in which they said that they would not expand NATO any further after the Soviet Union broke up. And they have posed a direct threat to Russia, which should have been understood by the Western thinkers long before they took such a step. I would also want to understand from you right. where are we at in, in the Russian in the, in the war. See, today if you take a look at it, Russia has got taken over almost 20% of Ukraine territory, 17% now after the fact that they have recaptured some of them. They have taken the entire southern province of Kherson, Zaporizhia, Luhansk and Donetsk. Virtually all of Ukraine, less about a 200 kilometer stretch of coastline is now with Russia. They have taken 17% of their most productive areas. They have reduced Ukraine virtually to a rump. And of course, they've inflicted significant damage upon Ukraine. Ukraine has been propped up into believing they can contest Russia by the West. The ammunition and the flow of aid which has been given is a kind of a low cost option which has been given to them to continue fighting and bleeding Russia. But unfortunately, I do not see it translating the battlefield because even the Ukrainian offensive has kind of ground to a halt in this recent offensive. So where we stand is, I think Russia militarily is in a much stronger position. 
Ukraine's hope seems to be to gather as much area as they possibly can to, to get to the negotiating table on their terms. Right. But I do not think it's coming about. I view this war going on for a longish time without conclusion because Russia has got its gains and it's going to hold on to it like they did in the Crimea. They announced it as part of them and the story finished out there. This was going to happen even with this war. Right. So in this book, you have uh, placed in front of us a lot of different scenarios that could be a end of the war. Right. What do you think is the most probable way of ending the war? The and most probable end would be definitely the fact that the area which Russia has taken over, all the four provinces I mentioned to you, Luhansk, Donetsk in the northeast, that's a Donbass, Zaporizhia and Kherson in the south. This area, which is almost 200, 250 kilometers deep, is now the area which is going to form the line of control between Russia and Ukraine. And that's the line which is going to remain. What implications would that happen for the rest of the world? What happens is now it's not just a line of control between Russia and Ukraine. It's a line of control between Russia and Europe. So that new iron curtain has come about. There was a perpetual drift between them. And uh, the Cold War is going to resurface. There will be a block of Russia and China. This is going to, ha I look at this war not in isolation, but something like the First World War. It set up a chain of events that led, that's going to lead to global conflict very much in the future as well. So, uh, we, we spoke about the, the implications of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. What were the major implications for India and how did you th think the India's stand on being See, neutral? See, India went to it? has played a very good role in this. You take a look at it, our stance has been based purely on, like Shai Shankar put it, national interest for the 1.4 billion Indians who are here. Correct. Now, if that, be, and for that we are maintaining relations with Russia, we are still buying the oil, we have refused the Western sanctions and, and rightly so. We also have good relations with Ukraine. At the same time, we have maintained our strategic linkages with the Western world, USA, France, Germany. So we have handled this delicate tightrope walk very nicely. We commercially, if you take a look at it, by our buying Russian crude, it actually is was the best thing to have been done in the circumstances. Because at the same, because Russia, the US, Europe, Western sanctions are targeting everybody but themselves. They are not sanctioning the the gas that flows into Europe. They are not sanctioning the the oil that flows through the pipes into Europe. So they have got no business to tell us whether we can buy it or not buy it. So what we have done is we have done it very well and by playing it in this particular manner, our standing I think has risen with all nations. Also we are optimally positioned to play the peace broker between Russia and Ukraine. And if that does come about, I think if we can, I won't say we can broker a peace, but if we can get the two parties to the negotiating table by virtue of the standing which Prime Minister Modi has got, I think that's a big achievement. Since you said India has the capacity to be a peacemaker in yeah. this conflict, hmm. how do you think uh, our upcoming G20 uh, leaders summit meeting in September will be able to transform? Because with this, I'm sure one of the items on the agenda would definitely be the Ukraine war. It affects every nation in the world directly. So in that, there would be proposals for peace which have taken place, which would be proposed by both Zelensky. Zelensky has got a 20-point peace formula, as you know. And Putin himself has got a point, his peace formula says that we are going to keep the area as we maintain. Zelensky says that we are going to go back to the pre, they are going to go back to, to giving away each inch of Russia, of Ukrainian soil. Now, this will be discussed and obviously there would be feelers made to both sides based on the peace proposals that come about during the summit, which I'm sure would come about. And I think today India is optimally positioned to play the role of what they call the honest broker between Russia and Ukraine. What do you think is India's biggest learning? Because we are we have neighbors like China who, who is very much capable of doing something like what Russia did to Ukraine. Hmm. So how do we learn from such an event and what can we do to minimize the threat that we hold? That's a very good question. 
You see, the biggest lesson from the Ukraine war is your own defense preparedness can never be allowed to be based on the hands of others. They were banking on the defense security on joining NATO without being strong enough to withstand the pressure that would come. And when the push came to shove, NATO flatly refused Ukraine membership. So for India, it is we have to understand that firstly, we have to be, our adversary is China. Our threat comes from there. We have to be strong enough to withstand it on our own. Alliances, yes, they are vital. In the first stage, they are vital. But do not bank upon your allies to bail you out or save you in a crutch. You have to be able to look after your interests on your own. This is what I feel is the greatest learning. Lately, I've been seeing India develop themselves as a great geopolitical power, wherein they're trying to maintain relationship with different mm. uh, nations. What is your take on the fact that India is creating a good relationship with a lot of uh, nations such as the US, yes. for instance? Yes. You see, now again, like I brought out to you, al allies and alliances are essential. Partnerships are very essential. So India, we, are, we are still have a very staunchly independent strategic policy, strategic autonomy as we call it. So by being, we, would, yes, we are being aligned to the US. We are friends with them, but not allies. Very correctly. We have made an outreach to France in which both sides share the same your strategic autonomy. We have made an outreach to the UAE, which is again so very significant, right? And these are very, very big things in their foreign policy because they are, these are not mere strategic ties. They are strategic and economic ties. And in the end, our role as a global power will be determined by our economic and strategic standing. That's how it is. A lot of people have, uh, you know, compared India mm. with Switzerland and how Switzerland caters to their geopolitical presence. Do you think we are the next Switzerland? Firstly, Switzerland is in a different position altogether. They have no threat. It is an independent nation within Europe which has professed neutrality. That is, their, till very recently, now they started veering towards a with NATO camp again. But because they had no threat. Correct. They were never at war with any nation for almost a hundred years. He's not seen war. India has seen war since the time we were independent. Within a month of independence in August, in October, we faced a first war with Pakistan. We fought four war with Pakistan and a 20 year long proxy war. We fought a major border war with China in 62, in 67, the major skirmish, skirmish in Galwan with an active threat and a disputed border of 3,400 kilometers. So we cannot be a Switzerland, but yes, we can be an island of stability in South Asia, which is strong enough to save, stave off the threats which emanate there. The next question that comes to my mind is on the change of uh, the geopolitical power that we see in the shift from the, from the West to the, to the East. What, what is your take on that and where do you think uh, India and the other nations such as China, Russia and the US are holding on to. Like you're right, the shift, the strategic arena, as they say, had shifted to the Indo-Pacific. In Europe, Europe, NATO was saying the main threat is China. They were shifting, USA was talking about the pivot towards the Indo-Pacific, as they say. Now, suddenly the Russia war took place and the shift has gone back to Europe. That has become the arena once again, so the focus has shifted back to Europe. But in the long run, China, India and the Indo-Pacific will be the area of the most vital strategic significance in this century. So India is the balancing power in the power shift between the West and the East, we can call it, with China and its allies. That is where our importance lies. And the two theatres are going to be complementary. Europe and China are going to be complementary. They are going to be in which there will be an alliance between China, Russia, North Korea, Iran and a few others and the European Union, USA and the allies on one side. In that, India will not be allied to a camp. We have this very, very wonderful element of, a, of strategic autonomy which we should always adhere to. But we will be the balancing factor 
that ensures that a good balance of power is maintained by both sides and by doing so, we can perhaps ensure global peace. In the times of technological advancement, hmm. how do you see the warfare changing? How do you see artificial intelligence uh, changing the course of the action in terms of warfare and international presence that we talk, talk about? You know, two things have come over in the Ukraine war is, yes, there has been a lot of infusion of artificial intelligence, drone technology, different, you know, information warfare, very, very big, cyber warfare, very, very big. But one thing is really the basic principles of warfare are the same. They have to, you have to have strong, motivated soldiers who are going to be there. You have got to have good equipment. You've got to have a mass of reserves with you. You've got to have firepower. These fundamentals will not change. It is how you apply them on the battlefield by using artificial intelligence, by using information warfare. I think that's one, that is the biggest domain. Info warfare, cyber warfare, observations that is so, so very, very important. They are all force multipliers. Does it also help in decision making? For of instance? course. Information, decision making is all information. You get more information, the better your decision making. So, if you have greater information warfare, the better your decision making, the better you can fight a war. Where does India stand in terms of the technological advancement that we, our, our military uh, capability has? You know, India is a major power in software. I think a software industry is one of the best in the world. It's a, one of, it's a major IT power. But I do not see it percolating so much down in the military domain. For example, we should have been having mammoth battlefield management systems percolating down to perhaps subunit level. It is still not very much there. So while we have the potential to utilize it, our actual application is about 10 years behind the time. But also India heavily relies on the Russian equipments in terms of yes. the military capabilities. How can we change that into for instance, our Prime Minister Modi ji says, make in India. How can we convert that into and, you know, have a good industry ourselves? Yeah. Now, make, Atman Nirbhar make in India is a very good concept. No doubt. We have to be self-sufficient. But we must be realistic about it. We do have the manufacturing base, but the technological know-how, we are 10 to 20 years behind, 20 years in cutting edge technology. And one of the things that's so encouraging is most of the deals which are taking place through are the fact that technology is being transferred into India. Right? So that will give us a boost. But remember, we will not reach that level anywhere in the next 10 to 20, in the next 10 years or not. But yes, it is a step in the right direction of manufacturing, developing a strong manufacturing base. But to reach that level which we want to attain, it's not just mass manufacture, it is quality manufacture. Quality. For which you need cutting in technology from the West, USA, France, Israel and other sources. Can we aim to be at par with China's capabilities? We can aim to be at par with, all right. And we will get there. But remember, the Chinese economy has got a 30-year head start of the Indian economy. We are catching up very fast and even now China seems to be stalling, it seems to be plateauing while we are still on the rise, including the population resources, everything. The fact that the West is moving away from China to within, all these make a difference. So to reach it, it will take some time. But yes, we will eventually get there, we would even surpass them with time. It take maybe 2040s, 2050s or so. At the moment, that head start which the economy had got. To play catch up with them is going to take us some time. Right. Your idea of huh. a book and the kind of approach you took in explaining the book mm. the way you did mm. it. Uh, would you like to share some insights on that? See, actually I began writing for the Sunday Guardian, a series of articles for them, which is what I decided then I will sit down and work, put the articles together. And again, following the war, there was a lot of interest in it. I put them all together. And that is eventually when the book did come about. And of course, the problem was publishing the book before the war had reached a conclusion. So luckily decided to stop at the, at the timeline of around December, when the, December 2022, when the pause in operations came about. And 
that was when this edition was released. Thereafter, as you know, the battle has progressed for about a year, almost a year, Bakhmut has taken place, the Wagner mutiny has taken place, the Russian offensive has taken place, the Ukraine spring offensive underway, which we hope to cover it in subsequent editions. Wow. So uh, now that we talk about your, your, your book on Russia-Ukraine, an updated version is in line. This book, like I said, we stopped it last winter. After that, a lot had happened. Russia launched the offensive in Bakhmut, the Battle of Bakhmut, which is the biggest and the longest battle. So that part is going to be included here. The Wagner mutiny took place, right? The uh, Ukrainians launched their spring offensive sometime in the month of May. NATO added Sweden and Finland to its ranks. So many actions and now new lessons are emerging about the use of drone warfare. Now, they, now you now gradually in the open source room, you can make out how they are being utilized. So these are the aspects which I hope to include in this particular book right now. Beautiful, sir. Well, it was really insightful for me. I had, I had learned a lot of few things. I'm sure it was really valuable for the audience as well. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed the episode, do like, share and subscribe.